Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Green and Morning Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Myself and Sam are joined by a man who just played the one season at Newcastle United, but one Newcastle United player of the season. It's a big welcome to Sebastian Besson. Good morning to you, Sebastian. How are you? Good morning, guys. I'm good. Yourself? Very good. good. Very good. Sam, it wasn't the it wasn't the best season overall in terms of Newcastle United, but but it was eventful. Very, very, <laughs> it was very, very eventful. eventful. I mean, it, it, it's great to get you on, Sebastian, to get that kind of perspective because you were you were only a kid at the time coming over from France. I mean, your, your English, I know you just teased us with your Geordie accent before we started, but how, how was that walking into to Newcastle from, you know, being a young boy in Metz? Um, honestly, it was one of the um, best experiences of my life. And as funny as it sounds, I had never been in the UK in my life. The first time I traveled abroad is to Newcastle. And to be honest, I didn't even know nothing about Newcastle weather. So I came during the summer thinking it was <laughs> going to be all sunny and all that. I came with a T-shirt on a, on a raining, piercing down day. <laughs> Honestly, it was wind. I mean, that was a big welcome to, <laughs> to the north. And um. But now, as a kid, coming up to Newcastle was, I don't know, a big adv- adventure. But for, honestly, uh, not because I'm on, I'm alive. I really loved it for many, many, many aspects. Yeah, that was really great for me. It, and, it was um, such a. Oh, sorry. Go on, sorry, sir. No, go on, go on, go on. No, I was just, just going to say it was. It seemed such a bit of a whirlwind to start with because you, again. You had a week's trial, didn't you? Which is very unheard of nowadays. Yeah, and long story short, when I I, I played the Toulon tournament with friends under 21, and my agent at the time told me that, oh, Newcastle is interested. But, and I was playing with France under 21. So, and he said to me, he was a bit like mumbling. He said, uh, yeah, but they would like to know how you would fit. I said, listen, they want me to come on trial. And uh, he said, basically, yeah. I said, and he was expecting me to say no, you know, because I was like 19 playing under 21 French team. And I said, yeah, I was that confident because for the story, a week before I had watched the, the movie Goals, <laughs> the movie go they were like for real it's a true story I, I watched that movie and a week later my agent telling me that okay Newcastle United interested I said nah listen no matter what I'm going and he said try so I went on try and uh, I came by myself I mean he dropped me at the airport and then he said to me okay I'm going to take you to the training ground and I said now nah, you know what fly back I don't need no babysitter because I don't want to be seen as a, a kid who comes in with babysitting, babysitter and all that. So I didn't speak a word of English. And as you're from Newcastle, Newcastle is not the best place to start speaking English. So with the accent. <laughs> so, but he dropped me at the airport. I went on the car, in the cab. I went to my hotel. And then I went straight to the training ground. And then the story began. See, the power of Santiago Munez really is unrivaled. (laughs) (laughs) That's on Callum Wilson, everyone. They just love (laughs) goal. It's unrivaled. You can't beat it. It's the best PR at Newcastle have ever done. Ever, ever, ever. It was like, even though there were like no coordination, they were playing for like they were kicking the ball some type of way. (laughs) That's the honestly, that stayed in my mind. And I was like, no, that's a sign. I saw St. James's Park, I saw the fans, and then a week later, I got a, a touch with Newcastle United going on trial. I said, yeah, let's go. It was meant to be. It was meant to be. It I mean, the, meant man- to be. the manager at the time was Kevin Keegan. We were aware that he was such a, a huge legend around Newcastle. And um, when did you first meet him? I first met Mr. Kevin Keegan, Sir Kevin Keegan, um, not my first time on the training ground because my first time on the training ground, I was with Chris Uton. He gave me like a 1v1 session. It was windy and every, raining and I was just literally, I was thinking, okay, I'm going for training. I'm going to meet the squad. And uh, bear in mind, in the squad, there were some Ballon d'Ors, Michael Owens, there were some big names. I was excited. I was 19. 
just turned 19. And then I saw Chris Uton at the training ground waiting for me. Yes, yes, Sam, Sam, Mr. Passard, come, come, let's go. Go away. Go out there. And he just threw some balls in the air. He was wanting to check how I was heading the ball and all that kind of stuff. I was like, where the hell am I? 1v1 like that. I'd have done it. So then I hadn't seen Kevin Keegan yet. Then the next day, day off. And two days later, I finally met Kevin Keegan. And I was impressed because uh, it's Kevin Keegan. And it was cool. He was really relaxed. He was chill. He was... That was good. yeah. That was really easy for me for that for that part of you. There's a lot of players talk about Kevin Keegan's man management being so important, and he makes you feel at ease. But was it Chris in, in particular at the very beginning, uh, Sebastian, where he was working on you more as a player, working on trying to improve you? And do you think he was the best manager for you throughout your career, Chris? Because he's well loved in Newcastle for what he did. Um, in the championship season as well. Chris, everyone knows that uh, I think what I think about Chris, Chris is my is my like British British dad spot on since day one. And um because for me I, I give a lot of attention to the science. He gave me my first training session over in the UK. And if he didn't give a green light, he hadn't given a green light, maybe I wouldn't have carried on. But somehow I kind of passed that test. And um, yeah, Chris played a big part in, in my career, especially my start at Newcastle because I needed to fit in. And as everyone knows, Chris is like, he's such a nice guy, but not in a, in a bad way. Like he understands the men, he understands the men's emotion, the kid emotion, he's been a player. So it was easy for me to really rely on Chris and he was he was trying to, he was speaking english but really slow for me to understand he was using a lot of you know like, he was really good honestly and that's when i i really clicked with him with the, with the language barrier when players because we see it a lot nowadays players who come over to england that don't speak the language how just intensive is it trying to learn english which isn't the easiest language to learn in the first place it is whilst you're trying to adapt to the english game as well English and difficult. Honestly, if you go to learn French, trust me, you're going to struggle. English and difficult. The thing is, I came at 19. I wasn't speaking a word of English apart from the school. Like, where is Brian? Oh, Brian is in the kitchen. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's all I knew. And I thought, I thought I spoke quite a bit of English. When I touched down, I was like, mm -mm -mm. You, ain't got, you ain't got no clue. Okay. So... The thing is, English and difficult if you really want to learn. Like, for me, it was, and I can tell it now, I'm retired, it's fine. I had a strategy in my head. I was like, okay, you want to be the best, but being the best, you got to speak the language. you got to be one of them. So don't hang out too much with, with French players, even though that, that was Charles, Habib, and Claudio Casapa was speaking French. I was like, they're, they're my safety net. They're my, they're my safety net, but... I need to hang out with English people just for me to really get you know, like in the system. And that's how I really feel like, you know what, Seb? You, you're a foreigner, so you can make mistakes. But just practice, practice, practice. And that's when I realized that you guys, I mean, the fans and the, the media, because I was speaking a little bit, people were coming to me because they saw that I was making an effort. So... I, I, I thought like, okay, I have to give them something. I have to give. So I was speaking English. I was trying. I was like asking people to write me all sentences. And I was like, just like remembering the whole sentences, the whole one. Then finding out, figuring out, okay, when can I use that sentence? Then there was no just words. I never took any English lesson whatsoever. Not even one. Not at all. Not right. once. Wow. But I was really adamant to learn to speak English because I thought, you know what? I'm on a mission. I got to be the best. I got to be the best. So that that comes into it. I have to speak the language. I have to speak like them. And I bought a Georgie book at the time, a little Georgie book to learn Georgie words. Of course, <laughs> I'm in Newcastle, <laughs> We're in Georgie land. You got to speak Georgie if you got like. And that's why sometimes. 
I was just throwing out some Georgie words. They were all over the place. Yeah, of course, because <laughs> I'm making. I, I'm not at home. I'm in my. You no, know, I mean their home, their land. Yeah. I better fit in, but in the right way. No, because for me, honestly, I love Newcastle too. You don't even imagine. I was like, no, 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 no. Even my, ne- my neighbors, my neighbors and everything, they were so nice towards me. I had to give something back. And that's why I learned. And I think every foreign player, if they get the right mentality, there's no excuse. You got to learn the languages really quick. Otherwise, it's not going to be, it's not going to be a success. At some point, there's going to be some limitation because you're not blending in. That's it. Yeah, it, it, you have to do those necessary things just to kind of almost, I was not going to say fit in, but just to feel a bit comfortable. But in terms of being comfortable on the pitch, what was the biggest thing that you had to adapt to very quickly in terms of Premier League football? Because again, it's a completely different landscape. So that's when you're going from one different league to another. And you seem to take it pretty well like to start with. And obviously that really helped you throughout your uh, career at Newcastle in terms of winning that player of the season. Um, I re- if you do remember when I was on trial, I play a friendly game against Don. I think I reckon it was Doncaster. Doncaster, yeah. yeah. and yeah. I had a number of fif- uh, forty something, forty-seven. Of I had a big number on my back, and um, that's when I realized I was known to be athletics, good in the air, and everything. They had a striker, honestly, I don't know, five foot nine or something. Black guy, striker. I start the game. I'm confident. I'm confident. First ball, long ball. I go for the ball. I go up for the ball. He comes and he literally bullied me. Bah! I'm on the floor. What? <laughs> I'm like, what? And I look at the ref. Like, he doesn't even pay attention. Play on. I looked. <laughs> I looked. I looked at Abib. Abib is like. I looked at Kevin Keegan. He's like. Come on, harder. So like, what? What do you mean? Second ball, exactly the same. I'm on the floor. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the big guy and I'm on the floor. I'm like, Jesus. And it's like, and Kevin went like, stronger. And it took me 15 minutes to really, really like, okay. I had to figure it out. I was like, okay, stronger, stronger. Said you go up. Well, what do you need to do more? And I needed to, there's... This is when something shifted in my head. Coming back to me adapting to the English football quick. Okay, I said, you got aggression. I'm, I know who I am. So at third ball, I went up like an animal. Like I went up and I just took everything. And I look at the ref, it's like, play on. And then Kevin Kig, I looked left to Kevin. He's like, there you go. And then I'm like, okay, this is what you want me to do. Okay, cool. So from that day, this is when I got it. I was like, okay, everything I know, it's a plot. But now, this is how I got to adapt my game. If I want to be who I want to be, I'm meant to be. And this is when I understood. And something shifted in my head. I'm like, okay, got it. This is English football. <laughs> I'm not going to like, I'm going to do it well. I'm going to love it here. Yeah. And yeah, then the rest, and there's loads of... Um, Stories about how I started playing, why, but yeah, that was it. Yeah, you you could definitely tell like you you grew into the the English game, and and it, it's no coincidence you stuck around in England for pretty much the rest of your your career. I mean, with the physicality side of it, I mean, there, I remember a couple of occasions you maybe took a, a, a little bit too far, <laughs> but uh, how much did you really relish the Premier League when when you got? Like I said, something clicked in your head, and ah, now I get it. Now I get it. Was this? What did it seem like? Yes, this is this is the football for me. Yeah, definitely. When I was in France, I was playing, and it was good. I was young, you know. Like I had to play in the French league, but I don't know. I was always attracted by the Premier League. I saw the intensity. I was watching on TV. I was watching Arsenal. I mean, because of the French players and stuff. So. And then there was Jeremy. Jeremy Njitap was playing for Newcastle, for, playing for Cameroon. So I was like, yeah, this is good. You know, like, you got that. And <laughs> the day, there's one day we played against Sunderland in a derby. 
with Newcastle at home, St. James, and there was a 50-50 ball between me and Kedwin Jones. Like, but we were coming from far, all full plus, full pace to the ball, and you could, I could hear the crowd, let's go. So there was, a, and that's when, and I went, for, we both went for the ball, but I went like an animal, and I just literally lifted him up, and I took the ball, I took everything, honestly. I hurt in my knee. I hurt my whole body. But I got, <laughs> I got the ball, and every, like I smashed him. And then I got up like a soldier. And it was like if I had scored a hat trick. And this, honestly, I was in such a pain. <laughs> I couldn't show nothing. <laughs> but I was in pain. And then I look around. I like, yo, now this is what I'm here for. <laughs> this is worth that more than a hat trick. So, yeah, I knew that it was my game. I knew I had the technical abilities because I'd been a Clairefontaine, French football. But that little bit of, um, you know, not aggression, but intensity. And that's when I found out, even at training, when the first training session, Kevin Keegan told me, like, stay on the side. You can't do that. And I wanted to do it. He said, you're going to throw up because the intensity, the box to box that he said to me, then in France, we're not going to run in the forest like uh, jogging, jogging, jogging. <laughs> he said, it's going to be intense. Box to box, he said to me, I said, yeah, I can do it. I swear, I almost faint. I was like, <laughs> I was chopping. <laughs> he said, kid, stay on the side and watch. And uh, that's when I'm like, no, nah, I love the challenges. Trust me, I'm going to be a king over here. Who impressed you the most, Seb, in terms of the players that we had at Newcastle at the time? Because a lot of there's a lot of talk that there's some players just didn't care, there's some players that really gave it in, in terms of everything for the shirt. Um, but who impressed you while whilst at your time at Newcastle? Like there's a different there's few players impressed me for different type of reasons. First and foremost, Michael Owen. More even if Mo was like at the end of his career, he was still Michael Owen. So when I got in the dressing room, I was impressed. Most of them, I had them like, you know, on the posters in my room when I was younger. So Michael, even though he, was, he wasn't going into the challenges and stuff, but he had such like, I don't know, a sixth sense about scoring goals within, within the box. I was impressed about how, how he was doing that. Who was was in, I was impressed with how many play in terms of football, football wise. Uh, Mark Viduka, his physicality, yeah. honestly, Dukes wasn't running at all. He was playing in the square, but in that square, he was a master technically. And uh, who was was in, I, I was young and crazy a bit, so. You know, I wasn't impressed by a lot of people and I needed that extra boost of confidence thinking like uh, I'm the best. I'm the one impressing myself. But yeah, Michael Dukes, Jonas Gutierrez was, I don't know, for some reason, Jonas, but he was so, like Spider-Man. He was so awkward the way he was playing. <laughs> but sometimes it was, yeah, I, it wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed, but I liked his style and he was giving everything. And for me, the mindset, the heart, that's what that's what I've learned. That's what Kevin Keegan told me when I came. Because one day I saw I saw them out all out. They were out, you know, out on the night out. And he said, and I was like, I came from an education, like, no, you don't do them things. And uh, he said yeah. to me, Listen, listen, all I want and all he, over here people want is you giving hundred and ten percent every time you're wearing that shirt. And he stuck, you know, it was stuck in my head. I was like, okay. He said, maybe you win, maybe you have a good game, but like, there's one thing you got to do. You give everything. And and that's how I started gauging people because I wasn't thinking, okay, you had a good game or bad game. Did you give everything? Did you not give up? Did you? And that's how I became English. And that's why I stayed because that's why I couldn't even leave England because I was stamped with such an identity of a British player that it was in, within my blood. Go on, Sam, yeah. you get the next one in. Yeah, sorry, my internet decided to be completely shit. 
But um, yeah. <laughs> uh, apologies if I bring up anything that you've already discussed. But how disappointing was it, Sebastian, that you only really got to play one game under Kevin Keegan and then everything just went crazy at the club? And was there any discussions in the dressing room throughout that season? Like, what is going on here? Yeah, that season was totally crazy in, yeah. for a lot of things. Like, honestly, there was a roller coaster in terms of emotions, in terms of actual facts happening, and there was no clarity. You know, sometimes it can happen. Of course, obviously, we were talking in the dressing room. I wasn't talking. I was too young. But I could hear stuff. I could hear stuff, and I could understand. And I was like, yo, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And even the staff, sometimes they weren't aware about what was going on. When Kevin left, obviously I was sad. I was really sad. I was like, yo, he brought me in. Yeah. He's leaving now. And um, we didn't know who was going to take care of us, who was going to be the te- caretaker. So Chris, at the time, he took over, but it was a bit forced. He, he was, I mean, I don't think he was ready at the time. Then but he had to fill in. But the thing is that we had um, such an experienced group we had an experienced group, so we could have we could have taken care of ourselves. We could have, if things were a little bit more clear. But it turned out that it went totally the other way. There was a split in the dressing. Yeah, there was a split in the dressing room at some point. And um, when when the when the head doesn't take care of properly of the house, the rest gonna crumble. So and that's how I felt it. Like that, I'm not trying to not take responsibility as a player. That was our responsibility. But at some point, we didn't have a good shepherd, a shepherd who could lead us. Like, okay, this is the direction. Now I put it on to you guys. Perform, execute. We were left on our own, and everybody had different agendas. A little bit for some reason. I'm not. You know, it's been a while now, but that was. But you could feel like, okay, we weren't that far, but that split detail made us go down. And then it was for a long time. And at the time, we did, as a squad, we, I don't think we deserved to go down. We deserved as a whole. Yeah, I think that was fair because we didn't do the right thing, but that was really sad. And then, and then I had to leave, and it was even, even worse. Just quickly going before we talk about the, the end of that season, just quickly going back a little bit, Seb. Joe Kinnear came in. Now, I, I don't want to speak too ill of Joe. I don't want to speak too ill of Joe Kinnear because I know he's got a lot of um, health issues at the minute. And again, I know he, he probably, you'll say he tried his best for Newcastle, but it just never worked. And it, 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 it looked like the players just weren't getting a lot out of him either. How difficult was it to work for him? The, Joe Kinnear came. <laughs> after Kevin. When 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 Kevin left, he left a big hole. Kevin wasn't the best tactician or it wasn't a Guardiola. Fair enough, but his aura, his presence, his, his man management were doing everything because he was a legend. A little bit like when Alan came at the end. For me, they were a bit similar. So, and then Joe Ekina came, a totally different character. It's like opposite. He, he look when you look at him, he looks like he doesn't give a shit. He's just there. No, he, that's how he looks like. Uh, no, no really, no real emotion. And so, and we had a big group with big names. So at some point, you know, like there's a way to handle this type of dressing room. You got to be close to the player. You got to be. You got to give them a lot of responsibility. I mean, you got to work hand to hand. If you're a bit disconnected for whatever reason, especially with the manager we just had before and the, the caretaker, which is Chris, which also is really close to the player, then you get to someone who is really far, make distances, it's a bit old school. So it start is, you know, like the gap is getting bigger and bigger without even realizing. So that's this type of small detail that people can't really see on a daily basis 
who made the big the gap bigger. So I'm not even blaming nobody in terms of coaching, but I don't think Joe was the right fit at the time for this type of dressing room. Because at the end of the day, we had Michael, Nicky, I mean, such a big players. They, they needed some responsibility onto them. Because they could have coached us. They could have managed. Michael could have managed. Nicky could have managed. Shea could have managed. There was Mark Viduka could have managed. Because they were experienced. They knew what to do. But at some point, how do you get them going? How do you get them fired up? How do you get them give the last little bit they've got? just to make United, Newcastle United the big star, like where they're supposed to be. So, you know, that's the... And I don't think Joe had this in him. No disrespect, but the uh, story is a story. Yeah, no, it was definitely a uh, a surprise when he got the job, let's say, <laughs> to, to everyone in football, I think. But... Um... <laughs> well, I'll give you a little story. He didn't... <laughs> Sometimes he was calling Charles Shola. He was calling Chola Charles. He <laughs> 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 was like, oh, you guys look alike. It's all right, mate. I was like, oh, coach, what that? That, 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 was, that, that was funny. Oh, bless him. <laughs> but was I think it would be fair to say that he's probably not the best guy to, to mend a split dressing room. But... Would you have expected more from your senior players to to kind of take charge of the situation and get us out of the mess that we were in? So, like you mentioned there, like Michael Owen, Ballon d'Or winner. But it's it, it would appear from the outside looking in that his attitude was a bit off towards the end of that season. Uh, if you, of course, now me being an experienced player, I know what it takes. And, um, but I think you can't really put it down to only the experienced player. Of course, yeah, they got a responsibility. And for me, that comes with the job. Then when you talk about Mo, Michael Owen, he's never been an extrovert. You know, like, he's never been extrovert. It's not someone who's going to come and really get you going because that's not his character. He's been a world-class player, but he's never been a, I don't know, a, a, someone who talks a lot. Someone like he was leading by example at the time, but then I think to get us out of that situation, he wasn't the one who could have just like gather people together and inject that kind of energy. That's not his character. Mo, I think Mo as a captain would have need like he needed some lieutenant around him who could have done this, who could have done this, and then Mo, because of his aura, when Mo speaks, you listen. He doesn't speak a lot. So that's what you need. Sometimes you need to know who is who. It doesn't, it's not because it's Michael Owen that he needs to shout, he needs to get people like that. That's not his style. However, there's other people that's natural for them. Whether you 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 wear the armband or not, it's a whole team. Like, okay, this is what you do. You, you play within your strength. There's some people they get people going, they empower you, they know who to get with a stick and who to put a, an arm around. So that's a combination of all that. And I think that we didn't have enough of that. Enough of that. The the, the experienced player we had, it's like Mark Viduka, he's a big teddy bear. Dukes don't scream. You know, like, he's a big teddy bear. And I love Dukes. But, you know, like, he's not the t- sometimes he's going to get angry, but that's not the cap of le- the leadership that we needed at the time. From my point of view, we needed someone who didn't care, someone who was gonna, who was legit, who was giving everything. Whether he had a good game, that's what Kevin Nolan tried to do. Yeah, that's what Kevin tried to do. Kevin ha- didn't have always the best game and all that, but his <laughs> work ethic was top draw. He was giving everything, and he, whether he was like slow, he- I don't know. People could have different opinions, but work ethic. So if at the time he was just coming to Newcastle, so he it, it was he it didn't have the credit enough to really impose his word, but he tried, he tried, he tried, and at some point he went mad. And if he would followed by other people, I think the dressing room would have been addressed quickly, quicker. And uh, yeah, 
does it? Yeah, I was, was going to just talk about the last little bit with, Al, with Alan Shearer taking over because obviously joking he had heart issues and he didn't have many games at all, Alan. But me and, me and Sam uh, were just talking features. just before. Oh, my yeah. second that. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> we, were just, we were just talking about it. Like, what do you, like before you came on, Seb, do you think Newcastle were a lucky Sam? And think, well, that Fulham game had a perfectly good goal disallowed. disallowed. The Portsmouth game, we were by far the better team and had a couple of good chances, and we only missed out by a point. Do you think if Alan had a few more games, he might have got that little bit of extra luck that would have probably kept Newcastle in the Premier League? Definitely. And it's like when Alan came for the last five or something, it wasn't enough. Yeah. Especially because what Alan brought was that fire. That f- he, when he came in the dressing room, everybody shut up. The legend is here. So, in every team talk, he was talking not even about us, not even about himself. He was talking about the whole city, the whole 52 people in the ground. And that's what gets us going. It's like, listen, we know Alan knew what he was there for. The, um, so, he was there just to get us out of trouble. But how do you do that in an emergency situation? He just came and gave it all. As you saw on the picture, Alan was training with us. On that picture, he gave me a hell ball, like one, he almost <laughs> gave me a black eye. I remember that picture. And then I lift him up. I just put like, and then that's when he said, nah, you're my player. Because I wasn't scared. Because everybody was scared to, you no, know, he was coming in a challenge. Nobody wanted to bully him. I just like went in on him. And that's what, and then he sh- shook my hands like Seb this is what we need and then I understood as like the, and this is when I said Alan until the day I die I'm with you and that's the reason why I left is because Alan didn't stay we mm. had an agreement mean that, that that was it I said listen going championship with Newcastle every single day I do it only if Alan stays because I know we're gonna get back up but he's gonna empower people with the right spirit because someone who plays for Newcastle United is special. That's not, no disrespect to any other clubs. And I love Spurs, you know, like I'm a Spurs as well. But Newcastle, when you wear that shirt, you got to be empowered with a special spirit because that shirt means something. And Alan, this is, I thought that if Alan had more games, we would definitely have stayed up. Definitely, no question asked. But unfortunately, it wasn't the case. No, I remember that that week where we beat Middlesbrough at home on the the Monday night, and then that led to the the Fulham game. I was there for that Fulham game. I know, and I know you got sent off, Seb, but I blame Howard Webb. For, for that I blame game. him too. I, I <laughs> saw him like few, few weeks and years. I said, Howard, you fucked my career up. <laughs> <laughs> Like Sam, 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 Sam. I blame him, and I was that day. I cried in the dressing room. I cried because for me, I let the team down. Like I was so good that season. I was giving everything for the shirt, and when he was like very crucial, I got sent off. Me, and that was the first day, the first game, the game when we were, we were wearing the new shirt for the next season. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, something went crazy in my head. I was like, Seb, how, how, what, did you, what did you do? And I was so sad, not for myself. I was like, okay, I'll, I'll get over it. It's football. But I was like, no, if someone shouldn't have done that, it's you because the team needed you. I wasn't bigging myself up, but I knew what I was doing for the team and what I was bringing in the dressing room and in terms of aggression, spirit, and Alan knew, and Alan gave me a, such a big hug. I was like, yo. Oh. And I was so sad for a few days, yeah. That, that, that's the thing. It was like 19, 20-year-old, inexperienced, probably showing through. But when you did get sent off, it should have been 1-1. Yeah. Because he, he disallowed that Viduka header, which was perfectly fine. And, you know, where was VAR? in 2009 <laughs> but did did you travel down with the squad for the last game at, at Villa mm-hmm. that day mm-hmm. I traveled I was in the stand I almost got kicked out because I was going mad 
on in the stand, I was going crazy. I was just like, I couldn't sit down. I went in the dressing room at halftime. I gave them all a flipping bollock it. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and you see that picture of Mark Shane? Uh, <laughs> I, got so many, hold on. I got so many stories for you. That day, uh, anyway. But that's for the, another day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the last game at Villa, at Villa, yeah, I was there. I went to the dressing room. And I was just like, I started screaming. And Alan looked at me and said, listen, let me talk. I don't care. It's the last one. And I just like, I was mad. Because for me, it's like, what are you doing, guys? I mean, it's it's either you leave. I want you to die on the pitch. If you, you got to die, you so be it. And yeah, that's how I was. So I was passionate. People thought I was aggressive, but I was so passionate. And it's been... It's been following me all my career. People thought I was aggressive. No, it was passion more than aggression. Unfortunately, Newcastle, yeah, unfortunately, Castle did get relegated that season. And look, I've, I'm a, a, a read, and, and you can you can confirm or deny this. Uh, you know, they had a lot of offers on the table. Obviously, you went to Tottenham, you had Arsenal, Manchester City, and Everton, I believe, that other clubs that were interested in you. So you probably didn't need that Jordy book, really. I'm just saying you wouldn't have needed that Geordie book to go to Tottenham because that, <laughs> that would have been absolutely useless. <laughs> yeah, it was you. Like, when I signed for Spurs, honestly, I missed Newcastle when I came down to London. I was like, oh, yo, 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 where am I? This is a totally different world. This is London. I'm used to my little city, calm, lively. As Newcastle as it is, <laughs> lively. But I got to London, even in the first day I got in the dressing room, it was cold. It was cold. It was like, I mean, Newcastle is a big family. This is like the whole city. Now I'm in London, capital, in a big dressing room with big names as well. But the atmosphere is different. And I got there, I was like, oh, I miss my league, small town. Because I'm a simple guy, I don't, and I'm like, nah, now nah, I'm thrown into the. I was already in the big, in the deep end, but now I'm a different deep end, and with a little more sharks. Honestly, it was Jeff, it's London. I'm like, okay, let's go. So it's meant to be, it's meant to be. But yeah, I had a lot of offers, and I gave an interview to another Newcastle journalist a month ago too. And I said a lot of things. And I said, yeah, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave Newcastle. And to be honest with you, I've been offered the armband. Uh, with my new contract, I've been offered the armband. It was underneath. It was wow. underneath. Yeah. And uh, and I felt so proud. I felt so proud. Because the, the same way I started playing, at the start I wasn't playing in Newcastle. The first couple of games, my first game was against Blackburn. But I owe Michael Owen and Nicky Butt my career because they're the one who went to see Kevin and said, listen, no matter what you're doing, we know how it works, but the one who's going to play is the kid. That kid got to play because he's the, by far the best. So he's got to play. That's how Kevin called me in his office, started speaking in English that I didn't understand. But, and he said to me, are you ready? Stuff like that. I was like, uh, I didn't understand. I was trying to figure out what he was saying. I said, yes. And then he said, "You, Nikki and Michael came to see me. I called Abib for translation. Nikki and Michael call, came to see me, saying that you got to play. So I'm going to listen. He knew what I was about. But he said to me, are you ready? I said, yes, I'm born ready. And then he said, okay, next this week you play. And then I, I didn't leave the squad. But long story short, to the end, towards the end, when I had to, leave, I mean, we go down, as I told you earlier, my point was Alan stays, I stay. Because I don't know, I had such a bond with Alan. And uh, Alan talked to Harry. He talked to Harry because Harry came and said, listen, I got a few players from your squad that I'm in love with, but you got to tell me who's the one like, because you're living with them on a daily basis. Who's the one that I could have put my money on? For real. I know. And he didn't say the name. And then 
Aaron said, biscuit said all day long. And so for me, I said to Alan, listen, no, boss, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, a, I'm very loyal. I'm with you. Whether you, you, if you go, I go. If you stay, I stay. Then they offered me the armband, but Alan didn't stay. So what am I supposed to do? And then I had Mercury, and then things got a bit out of hand with the way I left and stuff like that. But sometimes it happened. I was young. But then I went, I got to Spurs and onto another story. Yeah. I think no one would have really blamed you for leaving, but there's obviously, it happens all the time in football, isn't it? Players skip training to, to push through a transfer. Is that because there's pressure from an agent or is that just because you had to get out because there was so much, so there the was truth? no direction. There was no direction coming do from Newcastle. The, do you want the truth or do you want the political answer that players always get? No, be truthful. The be truth. Careful. I didn't, first, I didn't know, nobody told me nothing from the board and they, they tried to, they kind of tried to play me a bit. They tried to play me a bit. I didn't like that because I, as I'm giving 120% all the time, I'm truthful. I'm, I got my core value. You try to play me to get me somewhere that I don't want to, I mean, it's, it's starting getting more shady, more shady. The prices that were big at the time. Okay, and then yes, I received some not pressure from uh, some of the club who were interested. They were telling me, "Listen, skip training." I said, "Listen, I don't do them things. Skip training, you're gonna get some fines, but we'll pay you. I mean, we cover the fines, but that's uh, uh, that's the truth." I'm gonna say some of the clubs. I can't, I can't no, give no names. So that's when. I was I was 19. I was talking to my agent. I was a bit in all over the place. First big transfer of my life. I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to do? So I stayed at home. I skipped training one day or two days. And I felt so bad. I couldn't sleep because I was thinking, like, what are they going to think about me? Like the fans. and I mean, like, that's not me. And all of a sudden, things were out of my control. Because usually I'm a control freak. I want to control my life. That's why I do what I do today. But I'm like, it's out of my control. And then it's just, things go poof, everywhere. And then I'm like, okay, Seb, cool. What are you supposed to do? You're going to just, okay, take it on. But yeah, I skipped training. And as I said, I apologize for people who felt like I was, I was being disrespectful. Because in a way I was, that's, for me, that's disrespectful. There's always other way to to handle those type of situation but however sometimes you got to do what you got to do and then you talk it through afterwards but yeah there was some pressure skip training we're going to fold the, the transfer they're going to do this and i was talking with chris you know i was honest with chris i said chris you know how it is you know me sab sab you're gonna come no don't do them things you put me in such a big situation i said i know but what you want me to do now I can't do nothing. So I stayed at home. I was playing PlayStation all day. I, was, I wasn't even, I was drinking J2 all day. I was thinking, oh my God. And one day I, got, I received a call. I said, okay, you're on your way. And I didn't have time to say goodbye. I didn't, I mean, that was a bit bitter for me. The only time I was scared when I came back playing with Spurs, with Spurs at Newcastle and I went out, you know, I couldn't not stay over. So I went out. And stuff, and I was a bit. Even when I came, the, the crowd was booing me a bit. Of course, fair enough. And uh, but then I received so much love from the Newcastle fan, even wearing the Spurs shirt. I was like, Whew. I was really. I was like, okay. So then, on private, I was talking with fans. I've always been close to the fans, so I was talking with the fans. I was trying to explain some stuff. There's obviously there's stuff you can't say, but. I was trying to explain. I was trying to be truthful to show who I was the same way they saw me for a year and even with the Spurs shirt. And then I was, <laughs> I went out and there was uh, someone split a drink on me. I went to our clubbing in Newcastle, no, not on purpose. And then I saw like, honestly, a bunch of Georgie fans coming like madman. 
they just took the guy out. Say, well, you know, who are you doing that for? Because he was getting in the... The man was <clears throat> arguing with me a bit. He was drunk. But they just came. Like, they lifted him up. Ba -ba 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 you know, he's a Newcastle legend. You don't touch him and stuff like that. You're mad. You're crazy. They got out, and I was like, guys, guys, chill. It's the same. To the day we died, we got your back. And so I was like, yeah, this is my new castle. <laughs> but, and then I so I like, okay. So I, the love was still there. It's like, you know, love and hate. It was a bit. So it was up to me to really calm everything down. And yeah, but I wish I could have left uh, in a different manner. And you wouldn't have left if Shearer would have stayed as manager? Therefore. I would have stayed. I would have stayed because Alan, Alan, his value, his mentality, his mindset was everything I was looking for, was everything I would love. He was just like so resilient, so dominant. He, he wasn't scared of nothing. He, he was just playing with his heart and he made things happen just because of his mentality. And that's what I was like, yeah, that's what I love. And for me, that... And that's what got me where I was because I came on trial. I came in uh, just like on trial. When you go on trial, you're going to be better than the players who are already there. It's not like you, can, you, you, so you got to outclass everyone. So, which is it's difficult to come on trial somewhere. People thought, okay, you're going to get on trial. No. What would it take you if you're not far, by far better than what they already got? And even when I was at Clairefontaine, I got like kicked out after two years out of three because so, I wasn't. So everything, there's a lot of things within my young career who got me that mindset of a soldier, of a killer, of a executor. And when I met Alan, and he elbowed me, and he was like, he would never, he was shouting at people at training because they didn't come at him. They were scared. And for him, it's like, no, you can't do nothing. It's not because I'm the gaffer. When I put the boots on and I train with you, I'm another player. And he was testing us. He was testing us, test, testing like what we got. And that's when, when he, he like he grabbed me like that. And as, for me, that was a tough love. It was like, yes, this is what I want. I know I can count on you. I can go on a war with you because you ain't scared of nobody. I said, gaffer, I'm going to take you out. I don't care if you're on, if you're on the pitch. <laughs> this is my pitch. So you come on my land, you're under my rules. He was like, let's go. And we had this, you know, <laughs> this kind of relationship. But and that's why, yeah, I would have definitely stayed. Because honestly, Newcastle gave me my life. For me, Newcastle gave me my career. Newcastle gave me my name. And I'm so grateful. I can't just like, you know, turn a blind eye and say, listen, this is just a club. No. Anything I can do for the tunes. For real, I'll do it forever. Good man, good man. When you look at Newcastle now, said they've obviously just been taken over. They're in a relegation battle, but they're outside of the, of the bottom three. Do you think that Newcastle can stay up? And if they do stay up this season, what do you think it'll be like in terms of transfers? Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of speculation for a lot of players in the summer for Newcastle. Uh, yeah, Newcastle had um, an example of Man City. For me, you should. They're the richest club in the world, now Newcastle United. And when the takeover happened, <laughs> I was I, I was happy. I was happy because for me, Newcastle deserves to be up there. But it doesn't like happen overnight. Regardless of the money you're having, it's not the money doesn't do not everything. It's a plus. Money gives you options. That's the difference. Money doesn't buy happiness. That's that's a cliche, but money gives you option. Now, Newcastle United has got options. However, I reckon they stay up. I reckon they stay up. And I hope and I reckon they stay up because they need... <sighs> nah, championship, no disrespect for the championship club. Newcastle doesn't belong there. Sorry, whatsoever. But... Now that them, of course, if they're staying up, there's going to be a lot of speculation. But they shouldn't do some mistakes. Like they should take example of from some people, some clubs who've done it before them. If they do the same mistake, it means they're crazy. I mean, like there's so many examples around for 
for Newcastle to not repeat the same mistake. Build, you got to build with time. You don't build with names because you all saw that. Name doesn't make a team. Name individuals doesn't don't make a team. You need people who fit the project. If I don't know, I'm not an insider, but Newcastle United should have a project. When you look at Liverpool, for instance, when Jurgen Klopp came, he came with an idea, with a vision. All the players he took on board was fitting his vision well, in terms of mental side, like psychological. Like he didn't get the biggest, biggest superstars. He turned them into superstars because he knew what they had in them. They could fit his vision. So my advice would be like, okay, you got the money. You got the money, which is fair, which is great. Now, how do you how are you gonna use it? I hope you're gonna use it wisely to build something because we want to build a team, a destiny, like the club is a legend. Now we need to build a team who goes along with the name. And for the next 20, 30 years, I don't know how know how long, but it takes time. And you gotta look at this more than the name. Of course, you got a price tag is called you could you can take someone from abroad who scored, I don't know, 40 goals a season. When it comes to the Prem, that's a different story. So what are you gonna look at? How are you gonna what's your strategy? And with the money they have, they can invest to have a greater strategy. They have the resources to get the best people to build the best team. I'm not talking about the players because people are focusing on players. They, they, no, it's everything around. It's going to like, if you got a good, secure environment around with quality, with like-minded people who's got Newcastle United at heart, best interest, they're going to bring value. And that's what they need. Bringing va- people who bring value, then they get the right player who go who fit the mentality, the vision of Newcastle United. Then, yeah, with time, they're gonna be up there. Uh, I hope. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> well, I hope that they're having a drink and celebrating that. Um, but just for people that don't know, what, what are you doing now, Seb? In terms of your life, because obviously you play for so many Premier League teams, obviously Tottenham and Norwich, and obviously Newcastle. We've mentioned today, but but what what are you doing in your life now? I'm a, I'm a life coach. I mean, performance coach. Uh, I specialize in uh, yeah performance. I'm a keynote speaker. I go around. I give my keynotes. You know, I've studied. I went back to school three years ago. It's been three years. And uh, now, yeah, I'm specializing in uh, personal development. You know, like, especially for youngsters. Because for me, they're the future of tomorrow. Like, you know, players in academies. This is what I do. I coach people. I coach everyone. But I'm specializing in football players and athletes. Athletes and football youngsters. So, um, yeah, for me, personal development is is the key for your success. If you know who you are, if you know what you're made of, your strengths and weaknesses, your blind spot and all that kind of stuff, there's only the sky the limit. And you're going to master your craft. You're going to master what you do. You can't, you know, take a, a dream away from a kid who wants to be a football player. However, I'd rather them to understand who they are and then to master their craft, to get their craft to the best level. So, and that does apply to on the pitch and off the pitch. So, um, for me, you can't only be, you know, a talent. Talent doesn't do nothing. You haven't done, you haven't done nothing for your talent. <clears throat> you haven't worked for it. It's been given to you. So, however, the work ethic, you grind, the will, yeah, that's what is going to take you to the next level. So, um, I, rub, I want to work on them because, you know, youngsters, when they get in the dressing room, the first in dressing room, the life is a life, life changing. It's, that that might change your life. You might, you might try to copycat things that ain't good for you, and I say openly because them kids. They might, if they don't know who they are, they go to the dressing room and they copycat what they see, which might lead them to a really, really, really bad path. 
So I'd rather them to know who they are because they're more than bowlers. They're bowlers, but they're human beings. The human being, they have strength and weaknesses. They have they had own identity. So that's what I do. I coach them. I, so when I do my keynotes, this is why it's a bit, I don't I can't reveal everything about the keynote. But what the keynote is about, I come and solve problem within when an entity got a problem. I come and then I work on it. Then we coach. I coach teams. I coach uh, corporate. But for me, that's the best way to have an impact on someone's life. Because you can change life. You can Because when them kids go to the uh, first in dressing room, they know who they are. They're not going to try to fit where they don't belong. Where they don't belong. And that's why, and I keep saying that story, when I came to Newcastle, when I went out for the first time, and they, called me, they got me to Florida's at the time. I was like, oh, <laughs> Where am I? I'm like, where the hell am I? I was like, yo. still there now, seven. Yeah, it's still there now. See there? <laughs> okay, I'm on, I'm on my way. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> but they got me to Florida, then they were out. They were partying, and uh, then they asked me, said, "You want a drink? You want to drink something?" They were having, you know, you get bomb, everything, boom, night out. <laughs> and I never drunk my whole life. I've never drunk, I never had a sip of alcohol my whole life. And then I was on trial, and then I was like, okay. He said, I was under pressure. They were, they were all there. Yo, what are you having? And I said, apple juice. And they start, I swear, laughing at me like, bah, bah. the banter went crazy. I felt so little, so small. I was like, oh, my God. Seb, I was so, saying to myself, Seb, you must maybe it's going to be the first day you're going to have to drink because the pressure was on. <laughs> I'm telling, and I haven't signed my contract yet. I want to fit in my new team. I want them to like me. I want to be part of something. And I'm 19. They were, and then pressure, pressure. And all of a sudden, I don't know. So I'm like, yeah, no. I got up. I went to the bar and I saw the J2O and I said, listen, this is what I want. I took it. And I said, guy, cheers. So the story is, I didn't try to fit where I didn't belong. That's not my, that wasn't me. That wasn't me drinking. and That's not me. So what I'm trying to teach to those youngsters or even elder people is like, you got to know who you are. You don't, why, would, why would you try to fit where you don't belong? That's not you. Be you. Be authentic. And at that time, I knew I was going to be the best of that team. No question. When I did, when I did that, it's like, <sighs> you guys can't live with me. I'm so determined. Like, what I can't, what I, you can't do what I can do. So that's, and that's why I want those kids, whether it's on the football pitch or outside football pitch, you got to know who you are and to excel. You got to be the best of the best. And for that, you got to know. Your blind spot, there's a lot of things, you know, like, and uh, this is why I explain in my YouTube seri uh, video series, SMS and stuff. It's a bit of, you know, before games to give them a little bit of boost, to, you know, to, to empower them, to give them a little bit of motivation. But yeah, my coaching, my keynote, it's a bit more self-explanatory. So this is what I do. And honestly, I'm really happy. I'm happy to have stopped football because every, everything came to an end and I was tired. Now, my real life starts and there's a life after football. People think, oh, no, football is just part of your life. Football is the vehicle. Can't, football can't be your destination. And I keep saying that. Whether it's even for you guys, what you're doing can't be your destination. It's only a vehicle is getting you to your destination. Football was a vehicle to get me where I am now. And I'm grateful because it was a great vehicle, it's a great window to get higher and higher and higher, to have an impact. But you got to find your own purpose. Football can't be your purpose because football stops at 35. So what, what am I supposed to do? Am I, am I dying now? Am I hanging myself up and so it's over? No. So your life, you got to find a better purpose, a bigger purpose, bigger than yourself. So now I'm on my way. I know that this is what I'm here for. You know, empowering, helping, changing people's lives, helping to get... And that gives me a purpose. 
bigger, way bigger than football. F football is just like, it's over now. It's okay. It was a part of my life. Now, real life starts. Now, I can't get to the, to, to the GP without taking an appointment with three weeks or the, to the dentist. Nice, real stuff. <laughs> it's not like next day, the next day, oh, go to the dentist. You, no, it's real stuff, but it's good. It's interesting. All of that. Fantastic. All of that. I mean, do you kind of... Obviously, you incorporate your own life lessons that you've experienced yourself through through football. But do you take on board the the kind of lessons that the likes of Kevin Keegan, Harry Redknapp, Alan Shearer have taught you through throughout your playing career? I mean, maybe not so much joking here, but you know, other managers that you've had, especially over here in UK. Yeah, uh, everything is a is an experience. Every person I came across taught me something. Then it's up to me to really see it or not. But everyone told me something. And whether from a fan to a manager to a secretary, there's something the value to take in everyone. So, yeah, Harry was special. And I had a special relationship with Harry. And um, Kevin, Alan, I haven't seen Alan for years. But, you know, for the time I've been with him, it was like, it was worth it. It was worth maybe some years so yeah, when I do talk about my not even only my life, when I do something, it's not even for me, it's for what I can get to other people. I'm talking to my old self when I was 19, when I was 17. Okay, Let's talk to the old Seb. And what did he need? What did he need to prevent some mistakes? What did he need to get to the next level quicker and to sustain that level? Because there's no, to get there is not easy, but you can get there through talent but then if you really want to make a difference so how do we do that and at the time yes i would have loved to have my new set there someone who's done it lived it is legit and he knows what he's talking about he knows what he's talking about and my my purpose my mo my motive are okay you gotta give you gotta give back there's something like new generation i got my kids now it's the same you got to teach them. You got to. You want them to be a better version of yourself. So that's what I'm trying to do, and that's what I do with them youngsters. Seb, it has been an absolute pleasure speaking to you for the last hour or so, talking all things Newcastle United and your career in football. It's been absolutely brilliant. And what we will do, we'll put in a link in our description when this goes out on YouTube, so people can see what you're doing and on YouTube and all the fantastic stuff that you do over there as well. So, but it, it's been absolutely brilliant having you on. No, no problem. My pleasure, guys. And uh, as a uh, last word, oh, wait, lads, is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> Sam, where can everybody listen to this podcast? It's available on every podcast platform. Uh, every Tuesday, a new episode release. So, uh, yeah, like and subscribe and uh, rate five stars if you're listening on iTunes and Spotify. All right. Well, from myself, from myself, Jonathan Greenwood, Sam Milner, and get the highway the lads. We'll do one more highway the lads, Seb, well before you go. <laughs> and guys, all right then, so away the lads go on Newcastle United. <laughs> <laughs>